And we'll start reading tonight at verse 32 in Hebrews chapter 10. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions, partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them who were so used. For ye had compassion on me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. For the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. For we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now we have just had a series of warnings uh, to those who have gone on with the Lord, who have been a part of what he's doing, and then who would be tempted uh, to uh, turn back and go into a life of self-gratification rather than to continue in a life dedicated uh, to the work of the Lord. And remember, he had given three exhortations uh, that we find earlier in the chapter, let us draw near, let us hold fast, and let us consider one another. And we were given uh, the thought that uh, Christians that are involved should regularly meet together. We should assemble ourselves together regularly. The story is told of, uh, of a man who uh, was very active in his group, uh, worship group, and uh, then uh, he got rather disgusted because uh, he saw that some were hypocritical and some were not diligent. And so he decided that uh, it kind of vexed his soul, you know. He'd go to church there and he'd see those around that he knew weren't living the life. And so he decided just to stay home and read his Bible on Sunday morning. So uh, several people had spoken to him. So one day a rather understanding brother uh, went to visit him on a rather cold uh, night and... Uh, the man who was absenting himself from the regular meetings, he was sitting there in front of the fire. And there was the tongs beside the, uh, the fireplace. So he took the tongs, the friend did, that had came to visit, come to visit him, and he reached in with the tongs and got one coal of fire. And, and then he reached and with the tongs and brought that coal of fire out onto the hearth of ways. And then he didn't say anything at all. He just greeted him and sat down with him and watched the fire there. But as they watched, the fire in the fireplace continued to glow brightly and burn brightly, but pretty soon the coal that was brought out by itself uh, just uh, just died. And uh, so uh, the friend that came to visit didn't say a word. He just uh, said, well, uh, I'll be seeing you. And uh, so then he left and so uh, the man that uh, was just staying home, he, he was right there with them the next Sunday because he had got the picture that no matter how much ablaze you might be with fervor, spiritual fervor, uh, you just can't stay aglow by yourself. Uh, it's just uh, a part of the Christian life that you need to be with others. You need to forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And uh, then he says, he shows why it's far worse to go all out for the Lord and then draw back into a life of sin than it is never had to have made a complete commitment, or that is an all-out commitment, to start with. And of course, from the rational standpoint, the reason would be that if you're very active in the Lord's work and being used of him, there are a lot of eyes upon you, particularly if you've been fruitful in leading other people's people to Christ, or you've been an influence in other people's lives, then if you go back into sin, 
obviously it's going to do much more harm for those than uh, had you not uh, uh, held yourself out as one who was uh, all out for the Lord. Now, in uh, when we had the warnings in the sixth chapter concerning those who just simply never got involved, uh, then the writer of the book here went on to say that he was assuming that the hearers of this book, those who were reading this book, were not like that. The rationale for that being, well, the very fact that you're this interested must mean that you're not uh, one of those who are thinking about turning back. So you'd have the same thing here. He's, he's so much as saying, now I don't really believe that you folks that are this interested are going to be the ones who go back into the sin. But it would be well if you would keep remembering the early days when you were first enlightened, all of the fervor you had and how you were willing to endure all kind of afflictions, this, uh, this word, this uh, phrase, ye endured a great fight of affliction, uh, could be translated a great conflict of sufferings. In other words, uh, you really wrestled with this thing. You just couldn't quite figure out why, if you were in the family of God Almighty, so many things were going wrong. Uh, it, it seemed like it, it uh, redounded to a contest. And uh, the contest was whether or not you would be smitten with so many afflictions that uh, you'd just throw, throw in the towel, so to speak. And so it says, well, well, you ought to remember that. You ought to remember back just in the former days or in your early days of Christianity. Now, you were just enlightened, and uh, you were all full of fervor. And yet it seemed like... Uh, you jump right in the middle of all kind of problems. And then in verse 33, he says, this was partly while you were made a gazing stock. The thought here is you were on public display that you might be ridiculed, uh, both by reproaches and afflictions. It says uh, you had uh, two different things in which you were involved. You were yourself reproached and made a reproach and you gladly identified yourself with others uh, who were suffering affliction and so forth. And then in verse 34, it said you had compassion on such as that were in jail, and you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Now what was happening about this time is that uh, the Christians, this, when this book was written, the persecution of the Christians was just getting started in earnest. And uh, it was a great thing, you see, uh, for a citizen to go around and pillage the house of a Christian because nobody would, would uh, condemn him for it. In fact, they would sort of applaud him on uh, because he was really doing a good thing. And so the, uh, the physical or the material wealth of these uh, early Christians uh, was being uh, decimated by these attacks. And it said that they took it joyfully. Now, why were they able to take it joyfully? It says, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and more enduring substance. The thought is this, that you're going to have a better time in heaven because you had more adversity here, because the comparison is going to be greater. It would be like, uh, let's suppose that you had enough to eat all your life. And you never really went hungry. And you got about anything you wanted. And so one time, uh, you have a steak dinner, you might say. Or one time, you have some specially good ice cream. Well, that's great, you know. But now let's suppose that the better part of your life, you just hadn't had uh, uh, sufficient to eat. And then somebody set you down at a banquet. Well, the comparison would be much greater, wouldn't it? And so the, the thought is the same. Now... Paul uh, brings this to our attention in, uh, in 2 Corinthians. He says some things there that's hard for us to understand. He says he actually uh, was joyous uh, about affliction. Uh, when he suffered, it, it made him all the more happy. In, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says in verse 17, For our light affliction which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 
He says, every time a Christian has adversity, that is working for him. Any time he has illness, affliction, tribulation, trials, that that is working for him. Because it's establishing a better base uh, on which he can stand. Uh, now, let's look at it this way. There are some Christians, if, if they got saved, and then fairly early in their Christian life they met with great adversity, they just go under. They just throw in the towel, they toss up their hands and say, what's the use? And God has to be very careful how much adversity or testing he brings into our lives because most of us just can't take much. And so sometimes it's a real compliment to what he knows about our endurance when he permits us to be tried. You see, uh, according to Paul, all of us need so much testing and so much trial in order to prove ourselves, so to speak. And s some of us have to receive it in very small doses or we'd go under. We just wouldn't understand. But he compliments it when, he's, uh, when he can bring these testings into our life in rather big doses because we advance in faith so much further in a much shorter period of time. And so our affliction is always working for us. It's doing something for us. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, establishing a foundation for us. And, and it's very difficult for us to to get that uh, through our heads, you know, and, and to uh, appreciate that. But it is possible to get to the place in your Christian experience where you can be thankful for adversity. And we know this is true because uh, there are instances in the scriptures, like in the fifth chapter of Acts, when uh, the disciples were beat, they said that they were just joyous over the fact that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. And, uh, of course, uh, Paul's experience. It is possible. Now, here's the good part about it. Let's suppose God lets something happen to you that you just always rather dreaded. And uh, he lets it happen to you, and he shows you that his grace is sufficient. You yield yourself to him, and you find you're not uh, defeated and all. Well, then what can Satan do to you? He can never hold that over you again as a fear because you've gone through it and you were victorious. So, to that extent, you've defeated him. Now, some Christians are so weak concerning these things that God can only measure out the flick affliction in little tiny doses. And, it, and they just don't progress very, uh, very fast. But others, they appropriate uh, the goodness of God and their faith and, and they grow in adversity. This has been true with individual Christians and it's been true with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the history of the church. Uh, the martyrdom uh, brings forth growth in the church. Now, we don't understand that, but it does. And we say, well, why can't God have some system that wouldn't uh, entail that type of uh, situation? Well, if there was another way, I'm sure he would. If there had been another way to save my soul, other than for Christ to have gone through what he went through, I'm sure that God would have had another way. And one day I'll, I'll uh, understand all that. But I could, should be able to even comprehend this now, that God has all of eternity to even things out. And... Uh, We'll get into that a little further as we go along in our scripture. But there, the thought is this, that they, in verse 34, they could take joyfully the spoiling of their goods, knowing that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. You know, this morning I was at a board meeting every Monday morning about 6.30. I attend a, a, a board meeting of the Lakeland Christian School in Lakeland, one of our uh, directors is a chiropractor by the name of Dr. Sly and uh, when his father died a good number of years ago Dr. Sly inherited uh, 
a little uh, home out on a lake up in Lake County. You know, a little fishing lake, a little uh, kind of a getaway up there. He had really fixed that thing up nice, uh, just so he'd have a place to get away on weekends. And uh, so he went up there just past weekend, and somebody had come in and just wiped the place out, taken everything, every bit of furnishing in the whole place, left only the bare walls, and that's all. Now, uh, this morning, he w he had the victory on that, and he was laughing and joking about it, and says, well, I've already thanked the Lord for it. Now, you know, we don't think like that, do we? Uh, and somebody asked him, well, Dr. Sly, why have you thanked the Lord about it? Well, the Lord says that that's, uh, that's working to my advantage. And... Uh, says the only thing he did make, uh, he says I, I know one thing I'm going to put the place on on, uh, on the market for sale because I don't want to be uh, worried with it anymore but if he didn't learn anything else he learned that that sometimes those things those little nests that we build for ourselves and our creature comfort and all of those are more of a detriment in this world uh, than they are a, are a good you know I knew a dear old uh, brother a uh, Christian brother he, he had quite a lot of money he lived in Lakeland and uh, but he was very very generous uh, with the Lord's people and the Lord's work. And uh, but he had him a he had him a home up in the mountains of North Carolina. And uh, up on on Bear Walla Mountain, uh, maybe some of you heard of that place. Anyway, that's where it was. And about every other summer, somebody would get in there and wipe him out. Take everything he had, you know, just haul up a truck while he was gone and haul everything up out of there. And he couldn't buy any insurance because uh, the insurance companies had paid off so many claims, you couldn't get anybody to insure him. And, uh, but he loved that place so much that he'd go and he'd refurnish it again, you know, and somebody would get it all again. And, uh, uh, he worried and fretted about that thing all the time. I would have, I'd have got rid of that thing so long ago, uh, but he wanted it, and he had it till he died. And uh, I don't know how many times he refurnished the place. But uh, uh, we don't understand that. But God has to teach us these things that uh, uh, that we have something coming. Uh, that's so great that when we get there and look back those of us that have suffered the most adversity will uh, will have the greatest comparison and uh, I'll assure you upon the word of God that uh, if you suffer loss of things health material things or whatever on this life that you may not get to the point on this life where you can be thankful for it but I will absolutely assure you, a thousand years from now, you're going to say that was a good thing that happened to me. Now, if you're going to say it a thousand years from now, why not start saying it now? Why wait till then, you see, if, if that's, uh, that's true? Well, these folks had that, uh, that type of view of things, that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Therefore, verse 35, cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Now, this word confidence means steadfast boldness is really what it means, which hath great recompense of reward. In other words, in spite of everything that was happening to them, they were boldly proclaiming God's word. And that was the only thing that, uh, that meant anything to them. And uh, th he says, don't cast that away because you've earned something. Uh, you have built up for yourself a reward. Now, I was telling uh, uh, Donnie Rux and uh, Frank as we were riding back last Monday night that uh, I'm sure of one thing, that God's people don't have a proper respect for God's system of rewards. I hear Christians all the time say, well, uh, rewards don't mean anything to me. Uh, you know, piously say, well, I, I, don't, I don't do it for reward. I'm not, I'm not interested in rewards. I just want to do the best I can, but I'm not interested in rewards at all. And they just 
uh, throw the reward uh, thing aside. Well, they don't know it, but what they're saying is, I'm not the slightest bit interested in God having eternal pleasure out of my being. Because that's what God's whole system of rewards is about. Uh, I can tell this about Frank because uh, he's not here tonight and uh, maybe he won't listen to this tape and then he'll not know I told it on him. But uh, he was talking about how uh, his son had made spectacularly, spectacularly good grades uh, on his report card. And uh, he says, you know, they just pumped old pop all up out of proportion. And he says, the only thing I could think to do proper is take him down to a good restaurant and buy him the most expensive steak on the menu. And uh, he said he sat there and watched that boy eat that steak. Now, who do you think got the most enjoyment out of that steak? <laughs> there is no way, there's no way in the world that Frank could have spent that amount of money and received as much enjoyment for himself from that expenditure. Is there? Well, now, if that type of thing is true, then don't we, wouldn't we believe that God has even a greater capacity along those lines? Remember when Jesus was, was here, uh, he was saying, uh, why, even here, if your sons ask uh, for bread, you don't give him a stone. Or if your uh, son asks for an egg, you don't give him a, a scorpion. He says, uh, well, if you, being sinful, would do good things because you're the father of a son, how much more would your father in heaven give good things to those who ask or those who are in his family? You see, we just, we just have a hard time getting our appraisal of God and his program in the right perspective. Now, this subject of rewards is a major subject in the Bible. If you want an idea of it, just take the first major uh, sermon that Christ preached, that that we call the Sermon on the Mount, and count the number of times he speaks about rewards in that one discourse. Uh, just get your, uh, just get your uh, concordance out and look at how many times you see the word reward in the 5th and 6th chapters of Matthew, for instance. And then it's all through the Bible. It's a very, very important subject with God. We're going to get it again. Now let's read again this verse that has it here, and then we want to read a verse from the 11th chapter. Uh, verse 35, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Chapter 11, verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now I assure you that this is not primarily speaking of unsaved people. It's speaking of saved people who seek him after they're saved. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just uh, uh, point out two or three more uh, verses. Of course, you wouldn't get all of the reward verses if you looked up reward in your concordance. Uh, for instance, just look at the next book over, the book of James in the first chapter. James 1.12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. This word temptation means testings of all type. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. Now that's what God has in mind. He wants to crown people with a crown. He wants that pleasure. It's going to give him great pleasure. And look, he says, you, my child, you have furnished the basis that I could give you this crown. And that's what he wants to do. But uh, he has to be just about it. God loves everybody exactly the same. Every one of his human creatures he loves exactly the same. Now, that's not hard for us to understand, is it? We believe that. Well, you see, if he did not have a system of rewards, that equal love would force him to treat us all exactly the same throughout eternity. And he doesn't want to do that. He wants to treat us individually throughout eternity. And therefore, he has a system by which uh, he can base eternal rewards. Now, this is very important because it's what this life is all about. As a matter of fact, if it weren't for this that I'm speaking of, he could use the angels 
to bring men to himself. Listen, angels would be so much better witnesses than we are that it wouldn't even be funny. They're not afraid of anything. And we cringe if somebody might ridicule us a little bit. An angel wouldn't have that problem at all. And uh, angels could do what we do much better. But it doesn't fit in with God's program of rewards. And he could, as soon as some angel led me to Christ, he could take me on to glory. What's the idea of leaving me down here? Heaven's a much better place. No. He's got a system going on, and he needs me here so that he can develop that system. And, and it's my job to yield myself to that, find out about it. The average poor church member has really doesn't understand the system. Never even gets acquainted with the fact of what God's really doing in this world. So he's not able to yield himself to a system he doesn't know anything about. Just look at the next book. That was first that was James. Now look at first Peter. And we have we have the same thought. He's talking about people that are in his service. Um, let's look at uh, first Peter chapter five, verse two. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight of it, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but be examples of the flock. Here it is, verse 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. See, God's interested in this. Now, he's interested in your not losing the reward. Uh, turn over another couple of three books to the little book of Second John. Second John. Verse 8. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. You see, that's what this 10th chapter of Hebrews is all about. He's citing ways that they won rewards. He says, look, you joyfully, joyfully took the spoiling of your goods, and when your fellow Christian was put in jail, you ministered unto him instead of cringing, and you boldly went forth and proclaimed the word of God when you knew that it would cause you persecution. Now, you earn great rewards by that. Now, I don't want you to lose them because you can lose them. And this scripture right here sh should be very adequate to let us know that. But it's not by any means the same scripture. Just turn over to uh, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Behold, I come quickly. This is verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown. It's possible to, for your fellow human beings to cause you to lose your crown, see? Now, on over to the last chapter of the Bible, just so we can be sure that this is an important subject with God right through to the very end. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. He says, Behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me, to give everyone according to his work shall be. Revelation twenty-two twelve to give everyone according. That's the whole question. Now, that's what our scripture in Hebrews chapter 10 is all about. He's saying, you have won rewards. Now, these rewards have great recompense beyond your wildest imagination. Remember, he said, he who gives just a cold cup of water in my name shall in no wise lose his reward. Uh, what God has in mind is just all out of proportion. That's what in in Second Corinthians four seventeen. That's what that mean. Uh, that that uh, what he means. Great recompense, or, or uh, um, it's um, it's it has exceeding reward. In in Hebrews chapter uh, ten, this is a very much of a superlative statement, uh, ha which hath great in Hebrews ten thirty five hath great recompense of reward. That's a superlative statement. Way beyond what your mind is even, even imagining. Now, when I say I'm not particularly interested in rewards, what I'm saying is I don't care whether God gets joy and fulfillment out of my being or not. That doesn't interest me. Now, God created me for his own pleasure. He created me that he might have a basis to bestow. He gets his enjoyment. See, God is not a receiver. He has to get his joy out of being a giver. And uh, so, therefore, 
he has to have a basis for giving. Suppose, for instance, that uh, it's the uh, it's field day and it's the day of the great race, you know, and we've come to the high hurdles. And here's this young fella. Every afternoon, every afternoon, he's out there on those high hurdles in his hometown, depriving himself of everything that he might win the race. Now, all he's going to get is just a little trophy of some type, you know. But he just beats himself out. Now, he's learned how to get over each one of those high hurdles. Now, here we are. It's the day of the race. And uh, the judge says, you know, I like boys. And I love them all the same. I really do. And some of these boys that are here in this field day, they're just not going to be able to get over all of those hurdles. And so the judge goes out and he takes all the hurdles off the race. Now he says, you boys take off. And the boys run around. Some of them get around fast and some of them get around slow. And here they come to see who's the winner. He says, look, he says, I love boys. And I tell you what, I went out and I got a trophy for everybody. Now here's one for all, each one of you, you see. I love you all the same. The same trophy that the guy got that practiced and practiced, the guy got that didn't do anything. Because he loved them all the same. Now I ask you, is that fair? Well, why do we think God's that way? It, it just, you see, uh, if we would only evaluate God in the same way that we'd normally evaluate, he, he needs a basis. And the prize must mean something. And that's what this is all about. That's what this life is all about. And... You may not believe it, but if you read the Bible enough, you'll come to the point where you'll be just like Dr. Sly was this morning. And that was 7 o'clock in the morning. And somebody was commiserating with him. He said, oh, that's all right. I've already thanked God for it. That's pretty good. You know. God had tested him and tried him and he was on top of it. What can Satan do to him? Not much. We need a we need a better appraisal in our own minds of God's program, what He's doing, and what He has in mind, and then we wouldn't be knocked off of our pins so frequently. Verse thirty six. He says, "You have need of something. You got need of something." You have need of patience. The more I read the Bible, the more I come to the conclusion that patience is the epitome of, of uh, the measuring process. That is to say that it's a better ruler to measure maturity than any other measuring stick. Patience. See, patience is fruit of the Spirit. But, you see, it's hard to detect love, for instance. Love is fruit of the Spirit, but love can be feigned, can't it? Yes. Uh, some uh, spouses fool their parents. I mean, fool, fool their spouses for years into thinking they really loved them. You read all the time, especially uh, in these uh, crazy columns that they write and so forth. Uh, uh, my husband just told me he's hated my guts for 20 years. You know, she didn't even know it. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, love can be feigned, and uh, but you know I don't believe anybody. I don't believe anybody can put on patience. They can feign humility. There's much false humility. True humility is the fruit of the spirit. So is love. You know, a lot of people can even feign joy and happiness. Go around with a chessy cat grin on their face all the time and, and inside just eating out. Put on a front. You can feign a lot of these things. 
But I, I've never seen anybody that can play act patience. And so I, I'm coming to the conclusion that patience is the ultimate in a good ruler, a measuring stick. Especially as patience manifests itself in reactions rather than in actions. God, you might receive the promise. That is the reward. Now, in verses 37 and 38, this writer is going to do a very strange thing. He's going to quote from the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. Isn't that strange? That's what he's going to do. But he's not going to quote directly. And so that you appreciate these two verses, I'll tell you a little about Habakkuk. Habakkuk was a prophet of Judah just before Judah was taken captive by Babylonia, 600 and something or so B.C. And he was a very perplexed prophet. He saw that his people, his fellow Israelite all around him, was very wicked. And he knew that they were God's people, and he couldn't understand why God would permit it. He couldn't understand why God wouldn't strike them dead. And uh, pretty soon it got to eating on him so bad. He says, God, you're a holy God. How can you put up with that? How can you just let evil go on? How can you let evil prevail and good be trampled? Now, I just don't understand that, God. Now, I know you're a good God. I've read all the scriptures and so forth, but I can't get that through my nougat. How, how can you be a good God and, and let things go on like they are? Well, God answered him. Says, Habakkuk, you just wait a minute, and I'm going to send the Babylonians, and they're going to do my work of judgment. And then Habakkuk was all the more perplexed. He says, Lord, the Babylonians, the, the Israelites are wicked, but the Babylonians are more wicked. How can you give them the victory? They're worse than we are. And so he was perplexed at that. And he got to thinking about it. And he says, you know, I know God has got to reprove me because my thinking's wrong. And I know he's going to put me in my place. But I can't understand all this, and I'm going to wait and see what he does. Now hold your place in Hebrews and turn back to that little book of Habakkuk. Let's see, it's about fourth from Matthew. Go back about four books from Matthew, and you ought to come close to it. It's just uh, before Zephaniah. Now everybody knows where Zephaniah is. <laughs> And if you don't, if you don't know where Zephaniah is, you know where Nahum is, and it comes after Nahum. Habakkuk. Now, I told you basically what was in the first chapter, so look at verse 1 of chapter 2 of Habakkuk. He says, I will stand upon my watch and set myself upon the tower and watch to see if he, what he, that is God, will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. He says, I know enough about God that something's going to happen. Now, I'm his prophet. As, uh, Habakkuk knew he was God's prophet. And I prophesied. And I've told these people that God's a holy God and he's got to judge wickedness. But I have accused God. I said, God, there's something wrong with you and your program when... Uh, first place you'd let this evil go on for so long and then when you would use somebody more evil than we are to punish us. And I've sort of made a, an accusation of God and God, I know, is going to reprove me. So I've said enough and I'm going to sit back and wait and see what happens. And that's what he did. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. Make it plain upon the table that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it may tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now, 
he goes on to tell Habakkuk what's going to happen. And it happens real soon. And then he goes on and applies it to the coming Messiah. He says, Habakkuk, just as surely as I'm going to bring judgment upon this wicked people by a people more wicked, I'm still going to bring all evil to judgment. And one day, uh, the Messiah will come and righteousness will reign. Now, uh, Habakkuk uh, got the message. See, uh, God said in, uh, he, he get, pronounces all these woes on uh, those that are evil. See about the middle of verse 6 of this chapter 2, you have a woe. Beginning with verse 9, woe. Verse uh, 12, woe. Verse 15, woe. And right on through here, you have all these woes. But look at verse 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. And in verse 20, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. And uh, he, he's, going, he's going to... Uh, He's going to settle everything out. Well, Habakkuk got the got the point, and he ends up on top. Look in the chapter three, verse eighteen. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the Lord, in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and so forth. Now he got he got the point. Now back to chapter two, verse three of Habakkuk. In that last phrase, he says, "Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come." It will not tarry. Behold, his soul that is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Now, you see that little statement, the just shall live by faith? That's quoted three times in the New Testament. It's quoted in the first chapter of Romans, in the third chapter of Galatians, and in the tenth chapter of Hebrews. So, uh, Habakkuk must have really hit upon something if the New Testament writers thought that it ought to be quoted three times. Someone has said in Romans the emphasis is on the just. In uh, Galatians the emphasis is on the faith and in Hebrews the emphasis is on the live uh, or put it another way. In Romans the just, not the unjust shall live by faith. In other words, uh, that whole section of Romans is about justification by faith. It says that, that now the righteousness of God has come apart from the law, speaking of that righteousness in Jesus Christ. So see, in Romans, the, the theme is it'll be the just, not the unjust, that'll live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And uh, when you get over into Gal uh, Galatians, the, uh, the comparison is is concerning those who have already been justified, but whether they're to live by faith or by the works of the law. That's what the whole book of Galatians is about. Are you going to live under the law or are you going to live by faith? You who have been saved, you have been justified. So there the emphasis is the just shall live by faith, not by works. But they, It's sort of like Paul said, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, so walk ye in him. How did you receive him? By faith. How do you walk? By faith. See? The just shall live by faith. Not by sight. Not by works. And then when we get to Hebrews uh, chapter 10, we can leave Habakkuk now. That's an interesting book. One time I had a Bible study. You know, I, I, I pick on those little books this way. Sometimes I'll finish a book and I guess don't get the word from the Lord as to what book to start next. So I always know he must want me to, uh, to teach one of those little books and I get Philemon or Jude or uh, Habakkuk or uh, Haggai in, in Lakeland. Uh, I had a biggest time in Haggai, just two chapters. I tell you, I never got to bless them. It took me three hours, three one-hour lessons to get through Haggai. And Lord blessed me more than anybody there because he just didn't let me know where I was supposed to go. And when he told me, it, I just kept going. See, right after Haggai, you have Zechariah. So when I got through Haggai, I knew I was supposed to go right into Zechariah. The two go together. So sometimes when I, when I come to the end of a book and I don't know what one to start next, 
I just pick any of those little ones and uh, and just dive in. And uh, there's always so much there that people didn't know. Well, there's a lot in Habakkuk. And, uh, and, and the clue to that would be the fact that uh, the New Testament chose to quote one verse in Habakkuk three times. That's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, so, in in uh, Romans, the emphasis is the just shall live by faith. Now, I didn't make this up. I read it somewhere, and I was trying to fit it together, and it sounds pretty good to me. So, uh, uh, if you don't agree with it, well, uh, I got it from somebody else. Uh, the uh, the just, not the unjust, shall live by faith. In Galatians, the just shall live by faith, not by works, but by faith. And in Hebrews, it's the just shall live by faith, not die. Now you'll see that theme in the whole next chapter. And so the emphasis there is on the living. The emphasis in Romans on the justification, the emphasis in Galatians upon the faith, and the emphasis in Hebrews on the living. And you say, well, I think it ought to be the other way around. Well, maybe it is. Try it and see. Uh, but this is the way it fits best for me. And as I say, I didn't make it up. Got it from somebody else. You know, as one Bible teacher says, uh, that if you're going to teach the Bible, you ought to be like an old cow that grazes in everybody's pasture but gives her own milk. Uh, so, uh, uh, the... Uh, that, that if you're going to quote from somebody else, be sure that uh, that you've uh, you're not giving somebody else's milk, as well as grazing in their pasture. Hebrews, chapter ten. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, his soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now. Look at this 37th verse again. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now back in Habakkuk, and it was it shall come and it shall not tarry. What? The judgment for sin that um, that Habakkuk was worried about. So there the emphasis was on the judgment. Here the emphasis is on the judge. For he shall judge every one. God hath committed all judgment under the sun, we're told. In John chapter 5, verse 22. So the emphasis there in Habakkuk is on the judgment here, which is an it. And here it's on the judge, who is a he. And for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. And if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. You mean that it's possible for a Christian to backslide? The whole Bible says yes. The question is not whether or not a Christian can backslide. The, que uh, the question is where is the destination of the backslidden Christian? That's the only thing that's questionable. Anybody can look around and see that Christians backslide. It's to what destination does he slide when he backslides? That's the question under discussion. And of course, this is used many times to show that uh, a person can draw back into perdition, and we'll, we'll cover that. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now, God is talking, and what he's saying is, if you give up your rewards, if you let somebody take your rewards, that's going to take away my pleasure. That whole thing we were talking about. The important reason why you should be very, very sure that you never go back into sin and lose your heavenly rewards is because you will rob God of his pleasure in your being. He won't have the pleasure of giving you uh, the most expensive steak on the menu. He wanted to, but he couldn't give you that steak and be just. Why? If Frank's little boy comes home with five D's instead of five A's, Frank said, well, that's all right, son. I, I'm going to give you a steak anyhow. 
That just won't work, will it? There's no basis there. And that's what you rob your God of. That's a, that of which you're robbing God when you take away his basis. And that's what this verse it means right here. It says, if any man draw back, my, it's God saying that, my soul shall not have pleasure in him, or I will lose my opportunity to enjoy bestowal upon that soul throughout eternity. Verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, there is a drawing back by an unsaved person, and there is a drawing back by a saved person. If you want to see the unsaved person that draws back, the very graphic description of him is in 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 2 Peter. Look just a moment. 2 Peter chapter 2. The whole second chapter of 2 Peter, that's about the unsaved man that involves himself or purportedly involves himself in God's work and draws back. But in, in Hebrews chapter 10, or in throughout the book of James, you have in mind the saved person who would draw back. And in neither case is it talking about whether he ends up in heaven or whether he ends up in hell. In neither case. And so in verse 39, he says, We who are, that is, we are who are born into the family of God are not of them who draw back into perdition, now, what does perdition mean? It means the place of utter destruction. And you have to understand what destruction means in scriptural terms. It means uh, to negate for the purpose for which it was intended. In other words, man was created, uh, created for the glory of God. And when man goes to hell, that destroys that basis uh, God gets no pleasure out of him. So an unsaved person draws back into perdition. If he draws back, a saved person is not of those who draw back into perdition. Perdition is a name for hell. Two people in the Bible are called the son of perdition. That means uh, uh, they epitomize perdition. They show forth all of its characteristics. In the 17th chapter of John, Jesus called Judas the son of perdition. In the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians, the Antichrist is designated the son of perdition by the Apostle Paul under the power of the Spirit of God. But we are not of them who draw back under perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. That's to whom these exhortations are all to, those who believe unto the saving of the soul. That's the person that's, uh, that's involved here. Now, next week we start out in chapter 11 with a, um, with a definition of faith. And I want us to pay attention again to this word hope. I, 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 let's just take the first verse of chapter 11. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. This word substance means that which uh, establishes a firm foundation, something on which you can stand, something substantial. Someone has said it could be, in the original language, the term could mean the same thing that a title deed means. Uh, faith is the title deed of the things hoped for. In other words, you're anticipating something and God gives you the deed to it now. That's what faith is. Faith is the appropriation of hope. And hope is, uh, in the Bible, is different from what we think of. Hope is the joyous expectation or the, uh, of a, uh, it's the expectation of a joyous certainty. 
It's something that's going to happen. So you anticipate it now. That's to hope for it. And you appropriate it by faith. And then you stand on it. And so when something adverse happens to you, by faith you appropriate what you will have one day and you say, well, I'm standing on this and so it really doesn't make that much matter. What can man do to me? It's just for a little while anyway. Really, what difference does it make? Well, it might make uh, some difference to the good if it's establishing a basis for me to grow and if it's establishing a basis whereby God might be pleased to pass out reward. You see, we have a tendency, when we see a fellow Christian in adversity, sometimes we say, uh-huh, what's he been up to? God's going to get him straightened out. I might as well watch this now, you know. And uh, that's not what God has in mind at all. He knows we're so weak and willy-nilly and yellow-livered that uh, he couldn't bring that into our life or we would faint under the onslaught. So he's got to treat us with kid gloves, you know, and let us come along real slowly. We're so faint-hearted. And we don't know, we, we can't tell when he's complimenting somebody. The just shall live by faith. And faith is the title deed to things of things hoped for. It's an evidence. It's an evidence about something you can't see. Faith is an evidence. Faith is not a pig in a poke. Now, I know everybody understands that kind of educated talk. Uh, you don't, you didn't get educated in the same corner of the woods I got educated in. Faith is something to stand on. It's something with substance. And it's something with evidence. And it's the only thing that gives you evidence of things that you can't see. And we'll get into that some more next week. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we really learned how to appropriate faith and have some of that good old evidence, some, that the title deed you could stand on regardless? Well, that would give you stability, wouldn't it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this book, and we pray that we'd uh, have our souls exercised by the promises herein and the instructions, and that we'd learn how to believe our God. In Jesus' name, amen.